Hello students. Today I have come up with an important topic of class 12th biotechnology. The topic we are going to discuss today is protein fingerprinting. So, what is protein fingerprinting? You must have heard the term DNA fingerprinting. Yes, it is similar to it. It is like assigning a signature to a specific protein which would help identify it by creating a map of the peptide fragments. This map would be highly unique to that particular protein. Therefore, this technique is also known as peptide mapping. Now, how can we define protein fingerprinting? It is an analytical technique for protein identification in which the unknown protein of interest is first cleaved into smaller peptides whose absolute masses can be accurately measured by many known techniques. Nowadays, the most commonly used technique is mass spectrometer, especially the maldi tof Therefore, its name has now become popularly known as peptide mass fingerprinting. Here we have a protein. The protein is first broken into or digested into smaller peptide fragments. These peptide fragments are subjected to the mass spectrometer. The result is analyzed in the form of specific patterns of peptide fragment arrangements which generate unique fingerprints. The major disadvantage of this method is that it is a comparative technique. So we basically need a protein sequence in the database or we would require a reference in our experiment. But the advantage of this method is that only the masses of the peptides have to be known. The time consuming de novo peptide sequencing is not necessary. It is rightly said that many inventions were just by chance, a matter of serendipity. In 1957, V. N. Ingram invented this technique while working on sickle cell anemia for Max Perutz in his laboratory of molecular biology at Cambridge. This invention proved to be a major breakthrough in the field of proteomics. This was the first time a researcher demonstrated that a single amino acid change within a protein can cause a severe disease. As a result, Vernon Ingram is sometimes referred to as the father of molecular medicine. Now, why does Ingram call this invention an example of the crucial importance of serendipity as per his published article in 2004? Well, here's an interesting story. Linus Pauling had recently announced sickle cell anemia to be the first and best studied molecular disease. He compared the electrophoretic mobility of normal hemoglobin represented by HbA and the sickle cell hemoglobin represented by HbS and found that the normal hemoglobin moved faster than the sickle cell hemoglobin. He also found out that there was a difference of just one charged amino acid between the two, but which one this he wasn't able to find out. At the same time, Max Peretz, the founder of Laboratory of Molecular Biology at Cambridge, was working on the solubility of deoxygenated sickle cell hemoglobin and stated that at low oxygen concentration, the sickle cell hemoglobin generated tactoids which were responsible for the distortion of the red blood cells into characteristic sickle shape. He was also able to deduce the structures of both the hemoglobins but was not able to find out the difference between the two. In the meanwhile, V. M. Ingram came to LMB to work under Perutz. Max Perutz assigned the work to insert a single heavy atom into the unique position of hemoglobin molecule and then crystallize that derivative. Ingram successfully completed the task and just then, Tony Ellison brought him samples of sickle cell anemia hemoglobin to study some 3D structures at LMV. Ingram generated interest in the unanswerable question of the difference between the two hemoglobins. He observed that the determination of the particular amino acids involved in the difference is made very difficult by the large size of the hemoglobin molecule. So he thought let me degrade these protein molecules into a number of small peptide fragments 
just as Edmund had done in his Edmund degradation method. With this strategy, Ingram devised the peptide mapping technique. As there was no mass spectrometer at that time, he combined two basic techniques, the paper electrophoresis and the chromatographic technique. Let us see the steps performed by Ingram. He took two samples, the normal RBC and the sickle cell RBC. First, he isolated pure hemoglobin from both the samples into different test tubes. Then, he treated both the hemoglobins with the proteolytic enzyme trypsin which cleaved the protein after the basic amino acid residues arginine and lysine generating a number of peptide fragments. In the third step, Ingram performed paper electrophoresis. This technique is useful for separation of small charged molecules such as amino acid and small peptides. He took two separate strips of Wattman filter paper, spotted one with the normal hemoglobin triptych peptides and the other with the sickle cell hemoglobin triptych peptides, dipped both the filter papers in the buffer at pH 2. After some time, the peptides started separating on the basis of their charge. The negative and the positive peptides moved in the linear fashion on the paper strip. He dried both the strips. In the next step, he took the two dried strips, attached them to the larger squares of Wattman paper and performed chromatography at right angles. He used a solvent system of butanol, water and acetic acid because in such a system, the separation of peptides would take place on the basis of partition coefficient. The partition coefficient between the solvent and the paper is dependent on the relative hydrophobicity of the peptides. That is, more hydrophobic peptides will move with the solvent to the longer distance. So, in the first step, the separation of peptides took place in this direction. While in the next step, the separation took place at 90 degree angle. This resulted in the two-dimensional separation of the peptides on the basis of two different criteria. Once these chromatograms were generated, they were dried and stained with a suitable visualization reagent like the ninhydrin where the peptide containing regions would appear as yellow-orange spots. Then the peptide map for the normal hemoglobin and the sickle cell hemoglobin were compared and Ingram found that one peptide was differently placed in the sickle cell hemoglobin map. See the difference over here. On examining this peptide and determining its amino acid sequence using Edmund degradation method, Ingram found that it had a valine substitution for glutamic acid at the sixth position of the amino acid. So what was the result? The peptide spots were spread out in a characteristic map. This characteristic map is known as the fingerprint of that particular protein. So the fingerprints of the normal hemoglobin and the sickle cell hemoglobin showed that all the peptides occupied identical positions whereas there was a difference in only one peptide that is peptide number 4 which appeared in a new position in the sickle cell hemoglobin fingerprint. It must therefore have a different structure and will represent the portion of the polypeptide chain where the chemical difference between the two protein lies. Thus, Ingram was able to find out where the difference was between the two chains of hemoglobin molecules. This is a much clearer chromatographic picture of the triptych digest of the normal hemoglobin and the sickle cell hemoglobin showing the difference between the fourth peptide. On further acid degradation study of the structures of the fourth peptide, it was found that the sixth amino acid was changed from glutamate to valine which generated the gelation of the hemoglobin thus resulting in the sickling of the RBCs. This peptide mapping has become a very useful technique to compare similar proteins from different sources. The mapping of various proteins has generated vast information 
which is now being stored into databases using computers so that this information may be easily accessible. Nowadays, no one uses the original methods used by Ingram, the methods such as paper, electrophoresis and the chromatogram. Now, mass spectrometry is widely used in protein analysis. Hence, the use of a peptide mass fingerprint has found widespread use in proteomic research. This was all about peptide mapping or commonly known as protein fingerprinting. I hope I have been able to clear all your doubts and your concepts. Thank you.